uh, Monday, uh, uh, um, July 25th, um, 2005, and we're here at the American Legion Post Home at 30 John Street in Sorbonne, New York. And present with us today, we have uh, Reverend Carl Ostberg. Ostberg. Uh, and uh, we also have Alan Grzynski, a uh, past commander, handling the, uh, the camera. And I'm past commander Bill Payne, doing the interview as usual. And we also have Ms. Harris with us, who represents the uh, Sorbonne Times. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So, um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted to avoid the draft. Okay. My number came up, I took my physical and I said, they're not going to put me in a green uniform make me hump hills for two years. I enlisted in the Navy so I got to watch that Vietnam War. They made me a hospital corpsman and I humped the hills in green for three years. <laughs> and spent it eight months in Vietnam with the Marines. Where were you living at the time you went to service? Toledo, Ohio. And uh, you mentioned why you joined. And did you particularly pick the Navy for? I did pick the Navy, Navy because uh, most of my friends were going in the Navy around that time. So it's kind of, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Where'd you go to boot camp? And, and they don't pump hills. No, they don't. That's their Where did you go to boot camp? Great Lakes, Illinois. Yeah. In the winter, cold, did, 26 below. Did you volunteer to be a corpsman? Mm. You know, they give you three choices in, in the, for school, if you're school qualified. Corman was my fourth choice. <laughs> They're always happy to please, yeah. Yeah. Then where, where'd you go for the, for the Corman training? Again, Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, one. Yeah. Okay, after, after you got done with Great Lakes? Where'd you Great go? Lakes, I went to Portsmouth, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And from Portsmouth, Virginia, I was drafted <laughs> into the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, into FMF Fleet Marine Service mm -hmm. and uh, did my FMF training down at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. What was that like? Wet and soggy and muddy. Mm -hmm. um, one of, one, I know you're going to get to a memorable experience, I'll save it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, a bunch of sailors, not familiar with the Marines at all, and were introduced to our drill instructor. Our first one, he didn't last too long, first he got sick, and, but the first one, I swear, as my memory says, he said his name was Sergeant Rock. And we said, we all looked at each other and said, this can't be, it's just comic book. And he let us know right away he was serious, and we found out right away he was. He proceeded to drill us, and he, in the Marines, in, in the Navy, when you give close order drill or you give drill, you understand every word that they're saying. Tan shine. Left face. March. Sergeant Rock got up and said, <coughs> and we just bumped into each other and said, who is this guy? By at the end of the day, we knew every word and every syllable he was saying. <laughs> you got through boot camp and training and everything okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cold, but uh, got through it. What year was that? 1965. 65. And um, which war did you serve in? You served in the Korean War. I and served the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Vietnam War, okay. 1968. Mm -hmm. offensive. Yeah. How, how'd that work out? Where'd you, where'd you, where'd you, where were you we stationed? We were stationed uh, just outside of Marble Mountain. Area yeah. uh, and control that area. Uh, what was it like when you first got to be about? Yeah, we came over as a unit. They activated the reserve unit, 5th Marines. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, we joined up with 1st Marines. Uh, they were all cooks and bakers in our outfit. Of course, every Marine's a, a, a Marine first, mm -hmm. but most of them had been cooks and truck drivers and bakers for a, a year or two. And we're not combat oriented even. Uh, we did have a couple, uh, several who volunteered to come with us, good, strong Marines who volunteered and, and uh, helped us uh, become real grunts. Uh, but when we went over, it was really scary because uh, we weren't really too sure of each other. We were thrown together from other units to make up this uh, 27th Marine Regiment. So a lot of us didn't know each other. We could pull out of other units in, in mass form. And it was 
was also at the same time that the Pueblo had been captured. Monterey had captured the Pueblo. The Coast Guard ship. And we weren't sure as we were staging whether we were going to be going to Korea or to Vietnam because it was that tense. And they didn't know it that yet. So it was, it was a little bit uh, hairy. And then when we got there, it was uh, we were put in six by trucks. We spent the night in some beaches in the hills and around Da Nang. And then the next morning, we trucked out to our base camp. And as we trucked out, we were, everybody had their M14. Nobody was issued ammunition. <laughs> Don't know why. So that was a little bit hairy because that was a long, long trip on a road that's uh, booby trapped and uh, ambushed a lot. And but we but we made it <laughs> without, without incident. So getting there was really scary. So you were up by Marble Mountain. Huh? Up by Marble Mountain. Yeah. And how did Ted Defense have started you? Yes, because we got there in February. Mm -hmm. And so Ted had already started the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a very tense time over there. And the area we were in it is it was the most heavily booby trapped area in all of Vietnam. In fact, they called it Booby Trap Alley. And uh, my first casualties, I had one gunshot wound, and that was by friendly fire and accident. Uh, all my casualties, probably the first, at least the first month I was there, was all booby traps. We had people join out for, who, who thought we were in a good area because there wasn't a lot of fighting. And they all couldn't wait to get back to their areas because of the booby traps. I mean, every day, almost every day, you went out somebody took the booby trap. And you patrol the villages around the area every day? Yeah. Looking for the economy the NBA? Exactly. Yeah. Did you, um, were you, you were in actual combat yourself as well? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Tell us about that. How, what was the first experience, let's say? Of actual combat. Well, of actual, the, the very first time I got, I remember getting fired upon, but not by friendly, friendly fire. Um, we were on patrol, and a man had a booby trap, and I treated him, and we they called for medic back chopper to come in, and as a young, inexperienced corpsman, I went out and helped guide chopper in because in, in training that's they told us how to do that so it seemed like that was my job and I went out and did that job and the uh, earth just opened up around me I was a target <laughs> and I got out of there real quick um, small arms fire um, automatic weapons fire and so then We got a charge against the tree line that was firing us. Go old Marine charge, go get a Marines, you know. Uh, during that charge, another man had a booby trap, and I treated him. And then another man had a booby trap, and I treated him while all, all this was going on in the fire. So, um, we finally got, they, they, whoever was shooting at us finally stopped. <laughs> and uh, sort of calmed down and found a uh, our place for the night and did our routine patrols and, uh, from the night and from there. But by then, everybody's leg was a rotor because of those booby traps not on the step. Yeah, you mentioned some of your most memorable experiences, and one, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, one time here at a Memorial Day service, you were a keynote speaker and you told us about a different Marine who got shot. Yeah, his name, uh, his name was Corp Muncie. It might have been Private Muncie. Um, and I believe he was with weapons platoons. Yeah, he, he was. We were had just entered. It was the second day of, of an operation we were on, uh, Operation Allen Book. And we'd gone into a, a tree line and got ambushed pretty much. And uh, some of us managed to take cover along the ravine. I treated some casualty coming out of, out of the tree line, and then I heard there were more casualties further up front, so I went up to them and uh, got zeroed in on again, and uh, all the earth on the path was getting kicked up in front of me, and I managed to dive into the, to the ravine. And there was one or 
two snipers that had that path just within inches of me zeroed in and took several casualties on that path, anybody that came close. So as they were coming by, I was telling them, you can't go get off that path. Um, this, this Corporal Muncy got up with a law rocket and extended it, which is a uh, really nice <laughs> And 3.5 rocket launcher in a classic, you know, fiberglass tube. And he got up to fire at one of the snipers, and there was one behind him. And it caught him right through both carotids, and he pumped blood out of both carotids the size of my thumb, just came out about this far each side. Fell in my lap and just cried, you know, oh God save me. And unfortunately, I'm not God and I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, and he did manage to crawl um, a couple meters over to my lieutenant, where my lieutenant was, and he died in my lieutenant's office. Interesting side, my lieutenant has since visited every, almost every morning he was in our unit, and or their family, and he visited his wife. And since then, so. But yeah, that was a uh, pretty hard one. And he was a tough Marine, you know. Uh, he was one of these two bullets, two, two gunpowder, small gunpowder and two grass and spit bullets, you know. Uh, tough, tough man. But uh, his thoughts turned him out when he got hit. Boy. What was your unit designation? Yeah, we were, I was uh, with L Company, 3rd Battalion, 27th Marines. 5th Marine Division, 1st Marine Division over there. Can you tell us another memorable experience particularly you had? Yeah, I had one when I first sat down, and I want to tell you that was funny. And <laughs> now it won't come to mind. Um, the whole experience was, was memorable. There's one I told you about a friend of mine who wrote a book uh, about our, our operation. Uh, this summer I met uh, a Marine that I hadn't seen in 30 some years since Vietnam. And we had lunch together. And he started telling me a story, and uh, I remembered it very vividly because I, I met a back the fellow. Um, it was a day we were going in on that operation on helicopters. And it was a, a hot landing zone, so it was under fire, small arms. Grenades, mortars. Uh, we got off and we were supposed to hook up with people who were already there. You know. And I got off and, and I went one way with my lieutenant, my captain, my radio man. That's usually the position they had us. Hey, captain or lieutenant always like you nearby for some reason. So, um, and I turn around and, and, it, and the la I, I want to say it was the last helicopter, but it may not. I don't and no, it wasn't, but I think about it. Um, but this helicopter is about 20 yards off the ground now, taken off, just everybody had piled out. And all of a sudden, some Marine comes running out the back of it and goes, flop. <laughs> and he was, he was a new guy. There's another name for him, but he was a new guy. Mm -hmm. And he was afraid he'd be left behind or get lost, <laughs> so he kept coming. But uh, fortunately, he didn't hurt himself bad. He could have broken his back. <laughs> 60 feet, but uh, he was at least, at least a story up there. So, uh, <laughs> Were you awarded any medals or citations? And uh, how did you get them? Again, uh, on, uh, on operation, I didn't get it. Navy combination and combat B, and that was for uh, just doing my job, just doing what one are supposed to do, you know, abandoned Marines, to try to keep them in service. <laughs> uh, we could really uh, explain to the listening public here uh, the relationship between the Navy Corpsman and, and the Marines. I mean, that's the one can tell you that uh, we always refer to our Corpsman as Doc. But there's no greater term of respect than the Marine Corps. You know, I knew that, and I especially knew that after Vietnam. And I kind of lost sight of it over the years, um, only because I hadn't kept in touch with anybody, really, until I 
found a, a website for our battalion on, online a couple years ago. And I would write, and I would just sign my name and tell them that I you know, was a former Intel company. And, uh, and uh, they would always write back Semper Fi. And I always figured, well, that's, you know, the Marines earned that Semper Fi. They worked for that band of brotherhood. And, and I mentioned it to somebody that, that you know, because they asked me why I didn't sign Semper Fi too. And I said, well, because I really felt that was something that the Marines Distinguished you a little bit, and then I was a foreman. And uh, you know, man, I almost got hate mail over that. <laughs> no, Doc, you're one of us. Um, so ever since now, you know, it's SF Doc Osberg. <laughs> how many, how many Marines do you think you've treated in combat? things for me to deal with was because of the way we lost people. Um, these booby traps were just uh, terrible things. And a lot of times you don't find much. Uh, and after a short period of time, I pulled back from getting real close with, especially in the new guys. I think we all did that anyways, but um, I think even more especially, and I, you know, I go through the names of these Marines and it's like, I don't remember these guys. I've blocked them off all these years. Um, I had dozens, dozens and dozens. Of, uh, Did you get wounds from bouncing Betty landmines? I'm wondering. Uh, I got scratched by something, uh, but I never really got any wounds. Nothing that I would ever put in for because I'd seen too many horrendous wounds I deserved. These people deserve purple hearts. You know, I had someone who fixed with a band aid, it doesn't count. So I got a little scar in my arm from something uh, that I was never sure whether it was uh, some incoming rounds or one of our own, actually. Uh, the M79 went up pretty close to me. And so I thought I might have been that. And, and I've got a permanent hearing uh, tinnitus that I've never said anything to the military about. Again, people were going out without heads, <laughs> going back to their parents' and coffins. And I'm not complaining about not being able to hear. Uh, while you were over there, how did you stay in touch with your family? We were, I was able to correspond through mail. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little slow. It was a little slow when you get out in the field uh, you know, a couple of weeks after it was ready. But I managed to keep in touch fairly well. But I was out in the field for the entire eight months that I was in Vietnam. In this field just about the whole time, right? Yeah. yeah. It was supposed to be a 13-month tour. Yeah. We got short uh, because we were resorting they pulled us back and I had the option of going back in or staying over. And it just made good sense to come home. <laughs> so when did you get there? You got there? Got there in February 68. Mm -hmm. So you came and back in? Uh, September. September 68. Yeah. So if you were in the field, I don't have to really ask you this, but what was the food like? It, it, it came in cans and tasted terrible. <laughs> <laughs> sea rations. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much it for a right? That was pretty much what I lived on. Once in a while, we'd get back to our TAOR for a day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I did get in one of the best, uh, a, a good memory, I guess, you, you might chalk this up to, was uh, uh, we got to uh, uh, do duty near Marlboro Mountain as the prisoner of war compound. Mm -hmm. Okay, up by hand tracks and field of the compound. Well, the only duty we had to do was to provide sentries at the wire at night. So it was pretty much liberty for me for five days. In-country liberty almost. Uh, Lieutenant and I would go over to, uh, he would take me over to the officer's club and try to get me drunk. Or we'd go over to the chief's club or we'd go to the NCO. You know, the one good thing about being in the corner with the Marine, I was welcome in all of those places, even though I was only in the HN, the equivalent of Lance Corporal. Um, the first night we went over to uh, the officers' club and uh, at the Navy base there, and the chief couldn't treat me well enough there. And 
and I ate three steaks about an inch and a half thick. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, really enjoyed myself. That was, that was one of the better better moments and one of the, the better meals. One other time we got steak when I came in off an operation and uh, got off a patrol. And they were uh, at the h and company, the Italian aid station, where we get some of my resupplies. Mm -hmm. And uh, all those folks who were working in Rio even better than us. <laughs> and they were cooking some steak, so uh, you know, they treated me pretty good with that, too. But usually it was uh, sea rations, peanut butter and crackers, <laughs> a fruit cocktail for breakfast. Make one meal last last all day. Mm -hmm. Fruit cocktail for breakfast, and then uh, make a meal for lunch or dinner, and crackers for a snack. Did you generally have supp enough supplies? For Generally, except the first few days we were on operation, then it was, you know, one one sea ration meal for two days. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for two people for two days. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a little bit hairy. You were able to keep your medical supplies? Uh, yeah, that they did a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. you, but mostly, because of where we were, mostly all I needed was a lot of battle dressings. Yeah. That was, you know, I just couldn't keep it up on mine. I had uh, um, bandoliers, empty bandoliers, mm -hmm. car bandoliers. Filled with battle dressings, they don't go out with them. They look like uh, Pancho Villa, except they were all battle dressings. Yeah. Did you um, have any kind of entertainment at all, ever? No. No. I, I got into the name once and saw part of a show somewhere. I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. Red right Cross. Uh, well, it wasn't a Bob Hope show. It was one of the good ones. The entertainment we had, we entertained ourselves. We had a couple guys that could really sing. We had a country and western singer that sounded just like uh, Johnny Cash if we wanted to. You know. Numerous events? How did you entertain yourselves? Any pranks that people were calling each other? Well, I think because of the situation we were in, we didn't pull a lot of pranks in the yeah. field because we were in the field too much. In the rear, sometimes uh, there were some things that went on. And if you had watched MASH, the way they behaved in that, there's a lot of truth in, in that kind of practical joke that goes on in combat with medics and the nurses in the rear. Um, we didn't get to do too much of it, except that we, when we, we had ice for our drinks, we used to tell them that we got it from where they kept the body so nobody would bother us. We didn't want, want to use up our ice. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of your officers and fellow soldiers? You know, it's such a tight band and, and you get to depending on each other. Um, it's, it is, when they talk about it being a brotherhood, it is such a close brotherhood. And I was fortunate that our officers the good officers. Uh, and there's always one or two of you not real happy with, but especially in retrospect. My lieutenant, uh, we all we all said the same thing. I'm lieutenant who would have marched in hell because he was just a cracker jail. And, uh, and if anybody can get you out, he'd be the one to get you out, you know. So uh, now you mentioned a little earlier about a book that was written about you. Could you just tell us a little more about that? Yeah, uh, Bob Simonson is a fellow's name, and I can't remember. If, I think it was a K company, but I'm not sure. Uh, but he's he's just recently published a book entitled Every Marine, and uh, the first first printing sold out, and so he's on the second printing. You know, uh, every every you know, it was an and the Marines got a copy, <laughs> and so that's why it sold out quick. That uh, was probably not a big production, the first one. Uh, but it's uh, excerpts from different Marines in the different companies, uh, talking about the experience from the time we mounted up to go to Vietnam until we returned. And uh, different Marines just telling little paragraphs of, of their stories and stuff. I'm listed in the book, but only in the very back under 
survivors I'll come. Yeah, I mean, but that's a good place to be, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I've listed, you can be on this one. Well, well. I didn't realize I, that he was um, taking uh, all these interviews and stuff. Uh, that's how I got that tape I told you about that I had a tape of myself after the after action report. And, um, because I would have given him some material, I probably wouldn't have been in the book too. I had some couple of friends on. Mm -hmm. so, that's sounds, right. sounds like the makings of the sequel. But yeah, it's really, it's really a terrific book. That kind of segues into it, what went on afterwards. If, if you, I don't know if you read uh, Oliver North's most recent book about the Pacific War, but it's, it's similar to that in the way it's, it's done. Do you recall uh, the day that your service ended, or let's say the day you <coughs> left Vietnam and then on? Um, well, the day I left Vietnam is, is, is actually kind of interesting. Uh, um, before, just before I left Vietnam, we were in an area just below the Naval Hospital. Trying to regret the BC from rocketing the naval hospital area in the day in the area. And we'd come back from boat patrol and I'd taken my boots off and I'd crashed because we were fairly, fairly comfortable and fairly safe where we were. Usually you didn't take your boots off too often. <laughs> um, and I got it in my head that, that, that I was going to go home in September. And I don't know how I got it. In my head, and I told myself that's just not going to happen. Uh, I got five more months to do. We came back into our TAOR, and uh, somebody met me at the gate right away and said, Carl, uh, you got to go to the Italian aid station and, and tell them what you want to do. So you know, it's 27th Marine to the 5th is, is going back to bring the flag back to the States. And Marines who are on the second tour are going to go back. And all those corpsmen have a choice of either going back or staying, going to another outfit. Well, at that time, if you came back to the States, you had to be in country six months before they could send you out again. Well, that was a general rule. They, they tried to live by it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it didn't work. Mm -hmm. But that was a general, general well, I did the math, and if I went back to the States, at the end of six months, I'd only have five months left to do when they would send me back. If I stayed, I could do my time, and when I got back, I'd have only five months left to do with me. I said, well, why take the chance? And I'll go home, and then they probably won't send me back. So that's what I did. I came home. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, I had that voice in my head that said I was going to leave, and it says in my gave me a date, December, or September 18th. On the 13th, we left. We were going to mount out and leave. I think it was. We got to Denae, and there was a holdup, and we were there for five days, left on the 18th. So that's just one of those strange things that you wonder. Oh, is somebody talking to you? <laughs> are you just, you know, Probably, yes. were you here before or what's, what's going on? <laughs> so you came back to the States. Came back to the States and I stayed, I stationed in San Mateo, California with the Marines for the rest of my tour. Mm -hmm. okay. You got out of, out of the Naval Service? I got out from there, right? I released from active duty uh, a little bit early. What was that? The following the year, 69. Over 69? So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's about the time I was going in. <laughs> The first to right? When you get out of the service, what'd you do? <clears throat> the first job, we drove cross country. Um, I was going to move to Connecticut from, from Ohio, I was married. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, actually, I was going to move back to Toledo. My parents had moved to Connecticut, so, we, and my, my wife's brother was stationed in the Navy, he was down in Norfolk. So we drove cross country to Norfolk. And then we were going to go up to Connecticut visit my parents and then drive back to Toledo. And, uh, well, you know what 
the eastern part of the United States looks like in October. We, we got uh, to Maryland and we looked at each other and said, we can't go back to Toledo. Toledo is flat. Uh, when they, at that time, you know, pretty much when they build houses, they knock everything, all the trees down. And, you know, they got to grow up all new trees. So they, we got all this color out of it, so we stayed in Connecticut, long story short. Mm -hmm. And I went to work for Kraft Lincoln Aircraft for a year as a fireman. Mm -hmm. And I uh, did that for a year and found it to be boring. And went to work for the state of Connecticut as a psychiatric aide. And I did that for a number of years. Did you get some education along the way in Europe? Hey, eventually. I joined the National Guard in the 70s. One of the fellows that we worked with at the hospital was a major in the guard and he kept talking to us and he said, you know, why not? And several of us joined. Mm -hmm. uh, when he found out I was a medic, he worked, was an engineer out there, but he could never get medics to come down from Hartford mm -hmm. to, to be with them when they were on the weekends. And he, so he, he found out I was a medic and uh, of course was with all these other psychiatric aids hospital people. He said, you know, I'll put together our own medical unit. So, we put together an illegal medical unit, <laughs> and he managed to uh, bomb shot a, a couple of jeeps for us, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I headed up the medical department for, for a year or two with the, with the National Guard, and uh, that was kind of interesting. Did you get any GI Bill benefits in the So that's, that's how I got into, into my education, mm -hmm. was through that. I had a fellow come around and asked me if I was using it, but it was near the end of my Ten years by then, and I said, "No, I said I don't. Know. It's all too stupid." And I said, "Yeah, I, I was I was a dummy in high school, and I said I, I probably couldn't, you know, if I took the SATs. I don't know if I could pass them. I really believed I wasn't sure." And he said, "Well, your grades were good enough to get you into course school. Yeah. Certainly, not pass your SATs." I said, "Yeah, I never thought of that." Mm -hmm. And. He said, you know, you can, you can go to school, it's like a part-time job, they're going to pay you to go to school. Yeah. I said, yeah, but i got to keep my grades up and work, i got family, i got kids, I got, you know, and the guard to boot. I said, that's a lot. He said, I said, I'll never, I'll never pass. I said, I'll have to give all my money back. He said, no, he said, you don't understand, you can flunk and still get your money. And I said, I can flunk and still get paid? I'm going. And I went immediately to the junior college and said, mm -hmm. I want to find it. And I, I managed to get two years of my education paid by the GI Bill for that. Yeah. And then the rest I had to move with the bill myself. Yeah. But I got my undergraduate, two mm -hmm. years of undergraduate work that way. What did you do then? I stayed uh, employed with the state. Um, I left the state after 10 years and went back to Ohio for a year and a half and worked in a factory because I figured I had reached a dead end and position with the state. There was one position higher I could get and I'd be locked in forever and it wasn't a position I wanted. You know, it was a supervisory position and it wasn't a hands-on position mm -hmm. and I'd just be making up time schedules and appointing people jobs and that, that wasn't for me. So uh, my brother-in-law had been working for 20 years in the factory in, in Toledo, thought he would get me there, and another brother-in-law was going to get me to Willis Jeep. Uh, more pay than I was getting, uh, better benefits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, packed up the family, moved off, like in Beverly Hillbillies, and uh, got there and uh, rented a, a house that my mother-in-law had inherited, was it a dump, and fixed it up, and, and lived in it for a couple months. Spent all the money that we had almost from selling the house uh, to get by because the job was just around the corner the next day, the next day, the next day, six months later, and I'm working at, uh, at a small factory um, because I couldn't hold out any longer. And uh, got my interview finally to go to Willie's Jeep. I said, Hallelujah, you know, now I'm talking to 17, 18 bucks an hour instead of seven. Went, took my physical that very afternoon. Took my physical in the morning that afternoon and laid off like 2,000 people. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not going to work there. <laughs> Put the house up for sale and came back east again, went back to work for the state. And uh, the same job uh, initially, and then I transferred from there and 
went to work for Whiting Forensic Institute in Middletown, Connecticut, which is a housing for the criminal insane, and worked with the criminal insane for a number of years. And I was ordained while I was ordained, but then finally left that. I got injured and uh, went out on compensation and got injured and took a meager settlement. Did you keep in touch with anybody you served with during the war? Only recently. I hadn't originally. I had lost, lost touch with, with everybody. I, I tried several times a couple of them that I was with, but I, I haven't been able to locate them. Mm -hmm. But since I found that website, once I got a computer and found that website, uh, I've been in touch with, with a couple of fellas. And my, and my old lieutenant and my old yeah, my old lieutenant came up last year and we went out to dinner together and had a great time. We have a new reunion coming up. We've had two that I missed uh, since I knew about them. There was one in Philadelphia, and I planned it to go, and just things didn't work out. My car broke down. Um, and then there was one in California, and uh, that just didn't work out time wise. Couldn't get the time. And now this next one's coming up in Dayton, Ohio, in October. Now I've got family in Ohio, and I'm like, gosh, I'm getting there if I have to crawl. <laughs> How do you feel about, uh, how do you feel your, your, your military experience affected your life in general and your feelings about the service and the war and so forth? I guess it just strengthened uh, those core values that I had growing up. So I grew up in the, you know, the product of the 50s and just before the, the, the social changes of the 60s just out of high school as all that was coming along. So I still had a lot of those, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong. You know, good guys wear the white hats. <laughs> and we were the good guys who were supposed to wear the white hats. <laughs> and, uh, and most of the fellow that I served with and worked with had a similar attitude. You know, and we were in Vietnam and they were posted, post, protesting over here and we couldn't understand it. Because we, we were doing what our country expected of us. They gave us a lot in terms of education and opportunity and, and, and a chance to, to do things and, and giving back was just a natural thing we did, even if we were drafted. You may not have wanted to be there, but you knew it was the right thing to do to give back to the country that has given you so much. And uh, those are attitudes, and, you know, conservative attitudes, you know, we say, but uh, they're, you know, we're not. That's, that's where I'm at. Anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> Probably, but I can't think of right now. It's one of those things, you know, when, you, when the, the interview's over, all the stuff floods back, floods to you. It's a little bit of a sequel to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I have some stuff and I have some information uh, that I would probably, probably share. And there's, there's some anecdotes out there that come back to me later on. My year in, in the service in Vietnam was, was a tough year. But and uh, there's probably one or two anecdotes that you can't put in the paper. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Doc. Uh, you're welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome back. Simple <laughs> <laughs>